Today we're just going to look at a, a Robert Herrick poem uh, from the early early 1600s, so uh, early 17th century. Um, Herrick was a cavalier poet, and uh, in direct sort of opposition to the uh, metaphysical school, uh, uh, the earlier school headed up by John Donne, which we haven't touched on. We'll be touching on uh, one of Donne's poems next day. Um, so. One of the issues here that's really important to the Cavalier poets is this idea of Concordia, Concordia discourse. So let's uh, just talk about that. Now, Concordia discourse. So is a uh, a violent yoking together of opposites, and it's it's more than just an oxymoron. Um, although you know it has the qualities of an oxymoron. It actually is more than that, and if you could really, if you could really think of it as pushing the pole, the two magnets together, and of similar poles, so the positive and the positive against the negative and the negative, um, and it's the energy that's released between the tension, the, the the forcing together of these these terms, and this is where additional meaning will come out of, uh, and that's what the the poet or the speaker is hoping that the reader will bring to the table, that understanding of the consequences. Uh, of the energy that's released between these two terms, and we'll get an idea of that later. Um, this concept here of uh, of the delight and disorder, the, the the text, the title of the poem here at the beginning, um, would have been uh, challenging for a 17th century reader. Uh, this idea of being delighted in disorder, uh, disorder being a decidedly negative idea, right? Uh, and and it, again, the idea of an ordered universe. This uh, comes from the earlier Neoplatonic concept of an ordered hierarchical universe. And when we touch on Shakespeare later, we'll be delving more into depth on this idea of Neoplatonism or Elizabethan cosmology. Now, this idea of, it sounds like a big word, lots of syllables, but basically what it means is Cosmos is universe, ology, G right there, ology is a study of. So it's, it's an understanding of how the universe is built and how it functions. And again, this Elizabethan worldview uh, would have had an Earth-centered world in which uh, the Earth is at the center and, and we have concentric spheres moving outwards. But as well, here would have been that the universe was built by a rational God and therefore should operate according to rational rules. We see this sort of this idea of the, the reasonableness of, of, of the universe um, moving all the way on. Later, we're going to be looking at some of Newton's ideas uh, on, on the clockwork universe and the fact that it, the universe is ultimately knowable uh, and it just takes a, the right questions to unearth or uncover its secrets. Um, and in opposition to today's concept that uh, you know the universe is a chaotic place, it has, it has laws and it has rules, but um, again, it's it's very chaotic, and we're maybe even touch on some chaos theory for fun. Okay, let's get back to the poem. Um, the idea that one could take the light in disorder, so it's enjoying or taking delight in something uh, negative, and delight again, even as a word, it's not enjoyment. It, it has a sort of an innocent connotation. There's ideas associated with innocence, childishness, um, uh, naivete, uh, these sorts of things. So you're delighted in disorder. Or you're, you're 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 whimsically enjoying chaos, and so right away we start to see the tension between two ideas develop in the, in the title. Not even getting onto the poem itself. So the poem itself is um, written in uh, iambic quatrameter. So there are four metrical feet here, uh, rather than the five metrical feet that we've seen in earlier sonnets. So that's kind of interesting. So Herrick right away is he's shortening the, the length of the lines. He begins, and, and the, the rhyming uh, scheme here is, is rhyming couplets. There's, you have to push it a little bit to, uh, uh, at one line in the poem, and we may look at that earlier, or sorry, later. But generally they're rhyming couplets of, of uh, eight syllables each or four metrical feet. Okay. He starts with a sweet disorder in the dress, kindles and clothes and wantonness. And these, are, these ideas are these little compartmentalized nuggets, so to speak, that he, he gives us. And when you're rhyming couplets, it's very challenging as a poet to rhyme couplets and not make them seem silly uh, or trite, to keep them flowing, keep them natural, um, 
it's, it's quite challenging. And try it sometime if you have to rhyme something in couplets. Um, and you don't want to try to keep it chanty. Right? It sounds like a, you know, uh, uh, you're casting a spell or something. So he starts with a sweet disorder. That's our first, our first Concordia discourse, where sweet disorder. And again, sweet being connected to delight. This idea that it's very innocent, it's very playful. But again, it's a, the tension between these two words is that he enjoys disorder. The speaker enjoys disorder. Now, um, for our purposes, I'm going to assume that the speaker is male. Um, it says, a sweet disorder in the dress kindles and clothes in wantonness. And this idea of wantonness is really, it's really mirthful. Now, um, or playful, whimsically playful, uh, to uh, enjoying the moment. Kindles, this idea of kindling. Kindles is, we, we looked at the evolution of a fire, building a fire, where you start with kindling. Um, so you have to have dry, dry material plus a spark. And so you have to have the ability for it to burn, but also the agency to start the burning. And that agency has to be the spark. And that's kind of interesting because later on, it's assumed that that spark will develop into a full-blown fire. And fire, often time, is a word associated with love or passion. You know, the flames of love burn bright, that sort of thing. So this idea of kindling and closing and wantonness, the early stages of attraction here. And um, that, is, that playfulness, that, uh, that uh, attraction, is centered around the clothing. And that becomes a very, very key idea here. Um, the next uh, pair of lines, a couplet that we're looking at, a lawn about the shoulders thrown into a fine distraction. And right away now we're going to start to see a item and an effect. So he is going to be looking here, an item and an effect. We'll, we'll see that move down through the poem. Um, so he'll make an observation, he'll look at something physical, and then he'll talk about uh, its effect. He says a lawn. A lawn is a, a scarf, right? A shawl or a scarf thrown about the shoulders. Um, I hope I spelled that right. S H A W L. Um, and it's he finds this distracting, but it's a fine distraction. It's 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 again connected with sweet. We start doing positive words. We see sweet, fine. We see delight, um, and this is the effect on the speaker. So he's this. It's, the distraction is, 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 is almost intoxicating. Again, an airing lace was here and there enthralls the crimson stomacher. And it's kind of interesting, too. This idea of airing lace, um, she's got a, a, the, the woman that he's looking at has, a, has a, a lawn about the shoulders thrown. There's an airing lace. We're going to later see crimson, a cuffs, ribbons, um, petticoat. <coughs> And right away, you're going to see her clothing. Her clothing is not indicative of someone of the lower classes. Um, it is clothing which would have been expensive, perhaps maybe slightly in disrepair, to suggest you know she may have fallen in her status. Uh, and we're going to put down here, um, fallen. To, there are different ways to uh, to look at the word fallen um, as you, you know, as you uh, progress. We'll be looking at other poems. But one could be that one's reputation has been sullied. Another one is financial or, or um, uh, status. You've dropped in status in a society. You've lost your fortune. Um, but another way is that perhaps maybe you've gotten yourself into a situation uh, that you ought not to have gotten in. And your reputation, especially in the area of your personal conduct, has been uh, compromised. Now, um, so the idea, though, is that her airing lace the lace is has errors in it, and and really there are perhaps it's torn, it's torn, uh, or there are uh, you know missing pieces to the lace. It isn't it, it's in disrepair to some extent, but that airing lace enthralls the crimson stomacher. Now I'm going to do a little sketch on the uh, right side here. Hopefully you'll see it. Um, the idea of the stomacher here would be this would be the woman's um, if you could imagine here. This is my little sketch here. There's the clothing, there's your sleeves, and the dress comes out from here. The stomacher would have been this area right here. Um, and that would be the lower part of the, the torso portion of the dress. And he's saying that the, the, so probably there's lace around it, and that lace is enthralling the crimson stomacher. In a sense, he's projecting his own emotional um, reaction or his own reaction, psychological reaction to the lace uh, and projecting it onto the stomacher. 
And so clearly, he, to some degree, the, the, the viewer, the man uh, who is watching this woman, the speaker, is enthralled by her. Cuff neglectful. Again, he's moving down to the cuff here. So we're going to, here's the cuff. He's looking at the cuff here. Neglectful. And uh, it is flowing uh, confusedly. The ribbons around it are flowing confusedly. Again, the object, our observation, and its effect is continuing. Observation and the effect. Uh, winning wave deserving note in the tapitious petticoat. Again, um, the, the wave of the petticoat as it walks, is, it's a winning wave. Um, and of course, it deserves note. It, it's asking him to notice it. And the petticoat, the tempestuous petticoat. Now, the idea of a tempestuous tempest is a, long, is a, a storm, oftentimes of supernatural origin. So uh, the tempest here is a storm. And the petticoat is sort of an underdress. And it's not, it's not the, the sort of, uh, it's sort of a lacy, it's a lacy underdress designed to give the actual dress some volume so that it doesn't lay flat. And it would have been sometimes seen only when walking because it would have been, you wouldn't want your petticoat to show, you'd want your dress to hang lower than your petticoat. But when you are walking, sometimes the lace of it can be seen. And so now this is to suggest that perhaps the woman herself has been walking by and he's been, this, this, in a sense, he's been going through here cataloging what he sees in that brief moment that she walks by. Now we get to a careless shoestring. The shoestring is careless. So now we've, we've made it down here and I'm not going to attempt to draw feet. Uh, I apologize. There you go. Um, the idea here is a, a shoestring he's moved to. Uh, the shoestring is careless, um, which means that it hasn't been tied perfectly. It's not untied, but it hasn't been tied perfectly. Uh, and again, it, to suggest perhaps maybe it was tied quickly and um, she was in a rush to get ready. Now, in all of these, he sees a, he sees a wild civility. And again, this is this is this perhaps the strongest uh, Concordia discourse in the poem. This idea of being both wild or untamed. And genteel, e e l, or civil. Now, this cannot be. I can't stress this idea or overstress this idea here of gentility or civility. And uh, my computer is slowly it should turn to red. I mean, no, there we go. Um, the idea of gentility or civility. Um, so clearly, this idea she is civil, upper class, perhaps. Um, and ought to be acting in a way different than she is. Now, what's interesting here, again, object and effect. Oh, wait a second, could draw. My computer is slowing down here. Okay, um, all of this stuff, all, he's just gone through, he's quickly cataloged and, and, and uh, cataloged the rhyming couplets, uh, everything he's seen and its effect on him. And then he steps back and he says, all of this that I see, um, hold on a second there, we'll get back here. All of this... He says that I see does more bewitch me than when art is too precise in every part. So he has been, and we'll try to get this computer to, there we go. All of this here, this is the effect. So he's brought us to here. He said that the, the idea she bewitches him, or in a sense her clothing bewitches him. Um, and he is intoxicated by her appearance. And he says he, he doesn't like art, the artifice of dress. And this is a great word you can use is artifice. He does not like that, the sort of the falseness of presentation. Uh, he doesn't, he likes rather, rather than when it's too precise, he prefers when it is its converse, its imprecision. In, in. Sorry, imprecise. He would rather have her be imprecise. Now, the idea here, over, you know, over and above um, just simply cataloging the clothing, is that perhaps if she is not careful with her clothing, she might not be as careful or fastidious, oops, that should be you, um, with her character. And in a sense, perhaps maybe um, she might be willing to, uh, I don't know, there's a certain distance between the speaker and the object that he's uh, looking at, um, and perhaps maybe he'd be able to approach her. Is she approachable? Are these clues or keys to her character? Is she, in a sense, uh, dressing like this on purpose? It's kind of interesting, too, because nowhere in this actual poem do you see the woman herself. She is absent. Um, we Normally, in this type of a poem, 
Uh, you would have uh, talked about her hair, her skin, her eyes, her lips, her her voice, um, the way in which she walks, not the way in which her clothing uh, is affected by her walking. And do you remember the uh, earlier Shakespearean poem that we did? We did both Sonnet 18 and Sonnet 130. Both of those uh, dealt with the physical, the physical characteristics of the woman, not her clothing. And so in a sense, uh, he is not concerned with the woman at all. In fact, the woman herself, she's sort of, uh, she's beside the point. Uh, it's the clothing that's important. He starts at the top, right, and he moves down. So we see him moving through um, the shoulders. I'll put the scarf here. And the dress itself would have been crimson. But he moves essentially from uh, here to here to here to here down and there's a, a movement straight down so in a sense you know as, as sometimes they're called elevator eyes um, uh, he has looking at her but not at her at her clothing hoping that her clothing is a is an advertisement or a, a billboard to her character now um, the irony here is that the art um, is she thrown together or is she put together uh, with deliberation and intent. And that's really the ultimate question. Because if you think that, if you're reading this poem and thinking, no, 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 she's not thrown together. She's an upper class woman or a woman of some dignity, um, uh, some breeding. She, of course, would dress the way she dresses intentionally. And so therefore, his response is ironic. Because he does not see that, in fact, um, he is the one being played here. And in a sense, one of the ways you can look at this poem is you can step back and ask yourself, who is the predator uh, in this poem, or who is the uh, the viewer, or in a sense, fishing? We talked about in class how uh, you know one uh, it could be fishing for someone. Oh, all right. I was just interrupted with the announcements there. Um, the question you know, we talked about in class is who's fishing? Um, is he the one standing on a? Um, on the street corner watching people walk by or in a social setting watching someone from a distance and in a sense um, what did uh, some of the students said scoping people out or is she the one dressing in a sense to attract attention um, dressing just provocatively enough that she would have a hint or a suggestion of impropriety without dressing too provocatively and that's that balance point here, because again, you know, in the 17th century, uh, one had to be very careful uh, to avoid scandal. So uh, it's kind of a neat poem. Uh, and how would you tackle this? Well, um, the idea would be simply to provide your uh, context first. So start with uh, the context, the, the social situation, perhaps, or the uh, dramatic context of the poem. And we'll try to here. Let's get some of this out of here. Um, and provide the dramatic context of the poem and then deal with it in terms of the couplets here so look at each couplet and go through that way and that's probably the best way to tackle this poem um, all right so good luck with it we will see the rough copies next class if you were absent uh, in the previous class please have the uh, 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 rough copies done um,